The Alley Man, 1959. The man from the puzzle factory was here this morning, said Gummy. While you was out fishing. She dropped the piece of wire mesh she was trying to tie with string over a hole in the rusty window screen. Cursing, grunting like a hog in a wallow, she leaned over and picked it up. Straightening, she slapped viciously at her bare shoulder. Figuring skeeters. Must be a million outside, all trying to get away from the burning garbage. Puzzle factory, said Dina. She turned away from the battered kerosene-burning stove over which she was frying sliced potatoes and perch and bullheads caught in the Illinois River half a mile away. Yeah, snarled Gummy. You heard old man say it. Nuthouse, booby hatch. So, this cat from the puzzle factory was named John Elkins. He gave old man all those tests when they had him locked up last year. He's the skinny little guy with a mustache and never looking you in the eye and grinning like a skunk eating a shirt. The cat who took old man's hat away from him and wouldn't give it back to him until old man promised to be good. Remember now? Dina, tall, skinny, clad only in a white terry cloth bathrobe, looked like a surprised and severed head stuck on a pike. The great purple birthmark on her cheek and neck stood out hideously against her paling skin. Are they going to send him back to the state hospital? she asked. Gummy, looking at herself in the cracked full length mirror nailed to the wall, laughed and showed her two teeth. Her frizzy hair was a yellow brown, chopped short. Her little blue eyes were set far back in tunnels beneath two protruding ridges of bone. Her nose was very long, enormously wide, and tipped with a broken-veined bulb. Her chin was not there, and her head bent forward in a permanent crook. She was dressed only in a dirty once-white slip that came to her swollen knees. When she laughed, her huge breasts, resting on her distended belly, quivered like bowls of fermented cream. From her expression it was evident that she was not displeased with what she saw in the broken glass. Again she laughed. No, nah, they didn't come to haul him away. Elkins just wanted to introduce this chick he had with him. A cute little brunette with big brown eyes behind real thick glasses. She looked just like a college girl, and she was. This chick has got a B.M. or something in sexology. Psychology? Maybe it was societyology. Sociology? Hmm, maybe. Anyway, this four-eyed chick is doing a study for a foundation. She wants to ride around with old man, see how he collects his junk, what alleys he goes up and down, what his uh, habit patterns is, and learn what kind of bringing up he had. Old man would never do it, burst out Dina. You know he can't stand the idea of being watched by a false folker. Hmm, uh, maybe. Anyway, I tell him old man's not going to like their slumming on him, and they say, quick, they're not slumming, it's for science, and they'll pay him for his trouble. They got a grant from the foundation. So I say maybe that'd make old man take another look at the color of the beer, and they left the house. You allow them in the house? Did you hide the birdcage? Why hide it? His hat wasn't in it. Dina turned back to frying her fish, but over her shoulder, she said, I don't think old man will agree to the idea, do you? It's rather degrading. You kidding? Who's lower an old man? A snake's belly, maybe? Sure, he'll agree. He'll have an eye for the four-eyed chick, sure. Don't be absurd, said Dina. He's a dirty, stinking, one-armed, middle-aged man, the ugliest man in the world. Yeah, it's the uglies he's got, for sure, and he smells like a goat that fell in the outhouse. But it's the smell that gets him. It got me. It got you. It got a whole stew pot full of others, including that high society dame he used to collect junk off of. Shut up, spat Dina. This girl must be a highly refined and intelligent girl. She'd regard old man as some sort of ape. You know them apes, said Gummy. And she went to the ancient refrigerator and took out a cold quart of beer. Six quarts of beer later, old man had still not come home. The fish had grown cold and greasy, and the big July moon had risen. Dina, like a long, lean, dirty, white, nervous alley cat on top of a backyard fence, patrolled back and forth across the shanty. 
Gummy sat on the bench made of crates and hunched over her bottle. Finally she lurched to her feet and turned on the battered set. But hearing a rattling and pounding of a loose motor in the distance, she turned it off. The banging and popping became a roar just outside the door. Abruptly there was a mighty wheeze, like an old rusty robot coughing with double pneumonia in its iron lungs. Then silence. But not for long. As the two women stood paralyzed, listening apprehensively, they heard a voice like the rumble of distant thunder. Take it easy, kid. Another voice, soft, drowsy, mumbling. Where we... The voice like thunder. Home, sweet home, where we rest our dome. Violent coughing. It's the smoke from the burning garbage, kid. Enough to make a maggot puke, ain't it? Look at the smoke's rising toward the full moon like the ghosts of men so rotten. Even their spirits are carrying the contamination with them. Hey, little chick, you didn't know old man knew them big words like contamination, did you? That's what living on the city dump does for you. I hear that word all the time from the big shots that come down inspecting the stink here so they can get away from the stink of City Hall. I ain't no literate. I got a TV set. Hor, hor, hor. There was a pause, and the two women knew he was bending his knees and tilting his torso backward so he could look up at the sky. Ah, you lovely, lovely moon, bride of the old guy in the sky. Some day to come, rum a dum dum, one day I swear it. Old woman of the old guy in the sky, if you help me find the long lost headpiece of King Paley that I and my father's been looking for for fifty thousand years, so help me. Old man Paley will spread the freshly spilled blood of a virgin of the false folkers out across the ground for you. So you can lay down in it like a red carpet or a new red dress and wrap it around you. And then you won't have to crinkle up your lovely shining nose at me and spit your silver spit on me. Old man promises that, just as sure as his good arm is holding the daughter of one of the falsers, a virgin, I think, and bringing her to his home, however humble it be. So we shall see. Stoned out of his head, whispered Gummy. My God, he's bringing a girl in here, said Dina. The girl, not the college kid. Does the idiot want to get lynched? The man outside bellowed, Hey, you women, get off your fat asses and open the door for kick it in. Old man's home with a fistful of dollars, an arm full of sleeping lamb, and a gut full of beer. Home like a conquering hero and wants service like one, too. Suddenly unfreezing, Dina opened the door. Out of the darkness and into the light shuffled something so squat and blocky it seemed more a tree trunk come to life than a man. It stopped in the eyes under the huge black Hamburg hat blinked glazedly. Even the big hat could not hide the peculiar lengthened out bread loaf shape of the skull. The forehead was abnormally low. Over the eyes were bulging arches of bone. These were tufted with eyebrows like Spanish moss that made even more cave-like the hollows in which the little blue eyes lurked. Its nose was very long and very wide and flaring nostriled. The lips were thin but pushed out by the shoving jaws beneath them. Its chin was absent and head and shoulders joined almost without intervention from a neck or so it seemed. A corkscrew forest of rusty red hairs sprouted from its open shirt front. Over his shoulder, held by a hand wide and knobbly as a coral branch, hung the slight figure of a young woman. He shuffled into the room in an odd bent-kneed gait, walking on the sides of his thick-soled engineer's boots. Suddenly he stopped again, sniffed deeply, and smiled, exposing teeth thick and yellow, dedicated to biting. Geez, that smells good. It takes the old garbage stink right off. Gummy! You've been sprinkling yourself with that perfume I found in a ash heap up on the bluffs? Gummy, giggling, looked coy. Dina said sharply, Don't be a fool, Gummy. He's trying to butter you up so you'll forget he's bringing this girl home. Old man Paley laughed hoarsely and lowered the snoring girl upon an army cot. There she sprawled out with her skirt around her hips. 
Gummy cackled, but Dina hurried to pull the skirt down and also to remove the girl's thick, shell-rimmed glasses. Lord, she said, how did this happen? What did you do to her? Nothing, he growled, suddenly sullen. He took a quart of beer from the refrigerator, bit down on the cap with teeth thick and chipped as ancient gravestones, and tore it off. Up went the bottle, forward went his knees, back went his torso, and he leaned away from the bottle, and down went the amber liquid, gurgle, gurgle, glub. He belched, then roared. There I was, old man Paley, minding my own figure in business, packing a bunch of papers and magazines I found. And here comes a blue 51 Ford sedan with Elkins, the doctor jerk from the puzzle factory. And this little four-eyed chick here, Dorothy Singer. And, yes, yeah, said Dina, we know who they are, but we didn't know they went after you. Who asked you? Who's telling this story? Anyway, they told me what they wanted. And I was going to say no, but this little college broad says, if I'll sign a paper that'll agree to let her travel around with me, and even stay in our house a couple of evenings with us acting natural, she'll pay me fifty dollars. I says, yes, old guy in the sky. It's a hundred and fifty quarts of beer. I got principles, but they're washed away in a roaring, foaming flood of beer. I says, yes, and the cute little runt give me the paper to sign, then advances me ten bucks and says I'll get the rest seven days from now. Ten dollars in my pocket. So she climbs up into the seat of my truck. And then this figure in Elkins parks his Ford and says he thinks he ought to go with us to check on if everything's going to be okay. He's not fooling old man. He's after little Miss Four Eyes. Every time he looks at her, the love juice runs out of his eyes. So I collect junk for a couple of hours, talking all the time, and she is scared of me at first because I'm so bigger and ugly and strange. But after a while, she busts out laughing. Then I pulls a truck up in the alley back at Jack's Tavern on Ames Street. She asks me what I'm doing. I says I'm stopping for a beer, just as I do every day. And she says she could stand one, too. So, you actually went inside with her? asked Dina. Nah, I was going to try, but I started getting the shakes. And I had to tell her I can't do it. She asks me why. I say I don't know. Ever since I quit being a kid, I can't. So she says I got a... Something like a fresh flower. What is it? Eurosis, said Dina. Yeah, only I call it a taboo. So Elkins and Little Broad go into Jack's and get a cold six-pack and bring it out, and we're off. So? So we go from place to place. They'll always stay in in alleys. And she thinks it's funnier in hell getting loaded in the backs of taverns. Then I get to see in double and don't care no more, and I'm over my freighties. So we go into the circle bar and get in a fight there with one of the hillbillies in his sideburns and leather jacket that hangs out there and tries to take the four-eyed chick home with him. Both the women gasped. Did the cops come? If they did, they was late to the party. I grabbed this hillbilly by his leather jacket with my one arm, the strongest arm in this world, and I throw him clean across the room. And when his buddies come after me, I pound my chest like a figurin' gorilla and make a figurin' face at him. And they all of a sudden get their shirts up their necks and go back to listen to their hillbilly music. And I pick up this chick. She's laughing so hard she's choking. And Elkins, white as a sheet, out a laundromat after me. And away we go, and here we are. Yes, you fool, here you are, shouted Dina, bringing that girl here in that condition. She'll start screaming her head off when she wakes up and sees you. Go figure yourself, snorted Paley. She was scared of me at first, and she tried to stay upwind of me. She got to liking me, I could tell. And she got so she liked my smell, too. I knew she would. Don't all the broads? These false women can't say no once they get a whiff of us. Us Paley's got the gift in the blood. Dina laughed and said, You mean you have it in the head? Honest to God, when are you going to quit trying to force-feed me with that bull? You're insane. Paley growled, I told you not never to call me nuts, not never. 
and he slapped her across the cheek. She reeled back and slumped against the wall, holding her face and crying. You ugly, stupid, stinking ape, you hit me, the daughter of people whose boots you aren't fit to lick. You struck me. Yeah, and ain't you glad I did, said Paley in tones like a complacent earthquake. He shuffled over the cot and put his hand on the sleeping girl. Ah, uh, feel that. No sag there, you two flabs. You beast, screamed Dina, taking advantage of a helpless little girl. Like an alley cat, she leaped at him with claws out. Laughing hoarsely, he grabbed one of her wrists and twisted it so she was forced to her knees and had to clench her teeth to keep from screaming with pain. Gummy cackled and handed old man a quart of beer. To take it, he had to free Dina. She rose, and all three, as if nothing had happened, sat down at the table and began drinking. About dawn, a deep animal snarl awoke the girl. She opened her eyes, but could make out the trio only dimly and distortedly. Her hands, groping around for her glasses, failed to find them. Old man, whose snarl had shaken her from the high tree of sleep, growled again. I'm telling you, Dina, I'm telling you, don't laugh at old man. Don't laugh at old man. And I'm telling you again three times, don't laugh at old man. His incredible bass rose to a high-pitched scream of rage. What's the matter with your figure and brain? I show you proof after proof, and you sit there in all your stupidity like a silly hen that sits down too hard on its eggs and breaks them, but won't get up and admit she's squatting on a mess. Aye, aye, Paley, old man Paley, can prove I'm what I say I am, a real folker. Suddenly he propelled his hand across the table toward Dina. Feel them bones in my lower arm. Them two bones ain't straight and dainty like the arm bones of you false folkers. They're thick as flagpoles, and they're curved out from each other like the backs of two tomcats out bluffing each other over a fish head on a garbage can. They're built that way so's they can be real strong anchors from my muscles, which is bigger than false folkers. Go ahead. Feel them. And look at them brow ridges, like the tops of those shell-rimmed spectacles all them intellectuals wear, like the spectacles this college chick wears. And feel the shape of my skull. It ain't a ball like yours, but a loaf of bread. Fossilized bread, sneered Dina, hard as a rock, through and through. Old man roared on, Feel my neck bones if you got the strength to feel through my muscles. They're bent forward, not... Oh, I know you're an ape. You can't look overhead to see if that was a bird or just a drop of rain without breaking your back. Ape, hell. I'm a real man. Feel my heel bone. Is it like yours? No, it ain't. It's built different. And so's my whole foot. Is that why you and Gummy and all those brats of yours have to walk like chimpanzees? Laugh, laugh, laugh. I am laughing, laughing, laughing. Just because you're a freak of nature, a monstrosity whose bones all went wrong in the womb. You've dreamed of this fantastic myth about being descended from the Neanderthals. Neanderthals, whispered Dorothy Singer. The walls whirled about her, looking twisted and ghostly in the half-light, like a room in limbo. All this stuff about the lost hat of old king, continued Dina, and how, if you ever find it, you can break the spell that keeps you so-called Neanderthals in the dump heaps and in the alleys, is garbage, and not very appetizing. And you, shouted Paley, are heading for a beaten. That's what she wants, mumbled Gummy. Go ahead, beat her. She'll get her jollies off and quit needling you, and we can all get some shut-eye. Besides, you're going to wake up the chick. That chick is going to get awakened up like she never had before when old man gets his paws on her, rumbled Paley. Die in the sky, ain't it something she should have met me and be in this house? Sure as an old shirt stinks, she ain't going to be able to tear herself away from me. Hey, Gummy, maybe she'll have a kid for me, huh? We ain't had a brat around here for ten years. 
I kind of miss my kids. You gave me six that was real pokers. Though I never was sure about that Jimmy. He looked too much like old Brian. Now you're all dried up, dry as Dina always was. But you can still raise them. How'd you like to raise the college chick's kid? Gummy grunted and swallowed beer from a chipped coffee mug. After belching loudly, she mumbled, Don't know, you're crazy and ever, I think you are, if you think this cute little Miss Four Eyes would have anything to do with you. And even if she was out of her head enough to do it, what kind of life is this for a brat? Get raised in a dump. Have an ugly old ma and pa. Grow up so ugly nobody'd have nothing to do with him and smelling so strange all the dogs that bite him. Suddenly she began blubbering. It ain't only Neanderthals has to live on dump heaps. It's the crippled and sick and the stupid and the queer in the head that has to live here. And they become Neanderthals just as much as us real folk. No difference, no difference. We're all ugly and hopeless and rotten. We're all Neander. Old man's fist slammed the table. Name me no names like that. That's a Gayaga name for us Paleys. Real folkers. Don't let me never hear that other name again. It don't mean a man. It means something like a high-class gorilla. Quit looking in the mirror, shrieked Dina. There was more squabbling and jeering and roaring and confusing and terrifying talk. But Dorothy Singer had closed her eyes and fallen asleep again. Sometime later she awoke. She sat up, found her glasses on a little table beside her, put them on, and stared about her. She was in a large shack built of odds and ends of wood. It had two rooms, each about ten feet square. In the corner of one room was a large kerosene-burning stove. Bacon was cooking in a huge skillet. The heat from the stove made sweat run from her forehead and over her glasses. After drying them off with her handkerchief, she examined the furnishings of the shack. Most of it was what she had expected, but three things surprised her. The bookcase, the photograph on the wall, and the birdcage. The bookcase was tall and narrow, and of some dark wood badly scratched. It was crammed with comic books, blue books, and argosies, some of which she supposed must be at least twenty years old. There were a few books whose ripped backs and water-stained covers indicated they'd been picked out of ash heaps. Haggard's Allen and the Ice Gods, Wells's Outline of History, Volume 1, and his The Croquet Player, also Gog and Magog, a prophecy of Armageddon by the Reverend Caleb G. Harris, Burroughs' Tarzan the Terrible, and In the Earth's Core, Jack London's beyond Adam. The framed photo on the wall was that of a woman who looked much like Dina and must have been taken around 1890. It was very large, tinted in brown, and showed an aristocratic handsome woman of about thirty-five in a high busted velvet dress with a high neckline. Her hair was drawn severely back to a knot on top of her head. A diadem of jewels was on her breast. The strangest thing was the large parrot cage. It stood upon a tall support which had nails driven through its base to hold it to the floor. The cage itself was empty, but the door was locked with a long, narrow bicycle lock. Her speculation about it was interrupted by the two women calling to her from their place by the stove. Dina said, Good morning, Miss Singer. How do you feel? Some Indian buried his hatchet in my head, Dorothy said, and my tongue is molting. Could I have a drink of water, please? Dina took a pitcher of cold water out of the refrigerator, and from it filled up a tin cup. We don't have any running water. We have to get our water from the gas station down the road and bring it here in a bucket. Dorothy looked dubious, but she closed her eyes and drank. I think I'm going to get sick, she said. I'm sorry. I'll take you to the outhouse, said Dina, putting her arm around the girl's shoulder and heaving her up with surprising strength. Once I'm outside, said Dorothy faintly, I'll be all right. Oh, I know, said Dina. It's the odor. The fish. Gummy's cheap perfume. Old man's sweat. The beer. 
I forgot how at first affected me. But it's no better outside. Dorothy didn't reply, but when she stepped through the door, she murmured, Oh, yes, I know, said Dina. It's awful. But it won't kill you. Ten minutes later, Dina and a pale and weak Dorothy came out of the ramshackle outhouse. They returned to the shanty, and for the first time Dorothy noticed that Elkins was sprawled face up on the seat of the truck. His head hung over the end of the seat, and the flies buzzed around his open mouth. This is horrible, said Dina. He'll be very angry when he wakes up and finds out where he is. He's such a respectable man. Let the heel sleep it off, said Dorothy. She walked into the shanty, and a moment later Paley clomped into the room, a smell of stale beer and very peculiar sweat advancing before him in a wave. How do you feel? he growled in a timbre so low the hairs on the back of her neck rose. Sick. I think I'll go home. Sure. Only try some of the hair. He handed her a half-empty pint of whiskey. Dorothy reluctantly downed a large shot chased with cold water. After a brief revulsion, she began feeling better and took another shot. She then washed her face in a bowl of water and drank a third whiskey. I think I can go with you now, she said. But I don't care for breakfast. I eat already, he said. Let's go. It's ten-thirty, according to the clock on the gas station. My alley's probably been cleaned out by now. Them other rag-pickers are always mooching in on my territory when they think I'm staying home. But you can bet they're scared out of their pants every time they see a shadow because they're afraid it's old man, and he'll catch them and squeeze their guts out and crack their ribs with his one good arm. Laughing a laugh so hoarse and unhuman it seemed to come from some troll deep in the caverns of his bowels, he opened the refrigerator and took another beer. I need another to get me started, not to mention what I'll have to give that damn bulky bitch, Fortiana. As they stepped outside, they saw Elkin stumble toward the outhouse and then fall headlong through the open doorway. He lay motionless on the floor, his feet sticking out of the entrance. Alarmed, Dorothy wanted to go after him, but Paley shook his head. He's a big boy. He can take care of himself. We've got to get Fortiana up and going. Fortiana was the battered and rusty pickup truck. It was parked outside Paley's bedroom window so he could look out at any time of the night and make sure no one was stealing parts or even the whole truck. Not that I ought to worry about her, grumbled old man. He drank three-fourths of the quart in four mighty gulps, then uncapped the truck's radiator and poured the rest of the beer down it. She knows nobody else will give her beer, so I think that if any of these robin figures that live on the dump or at the shacks around the bend was to try to steal anything off in her, she'd honk and backfire and throw rods and oil all over the place so's her old man could wake up and punch the figure and shirt off of the thieving figure. But maybe not. She's a female. And you can't trust a figure and female. He poured the last drop down the radiator and roared, There! Now don't you dare not turn over. You're robbing me of the good beer I could be having. If you so much backfire, old man will beat hell out of you with a sledgehammer. Wide-eyed but silent, Dorothy climbed onto the ripped open front seat beside Paley. The starter whirred and the motor sputtered. No more beer if you don't work, shouted Paley. There was a bang, a fizz, a sput, a whop, 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 a clash of gears, a monstrous and triumphant showing of teeth by old man, and they were bump-bumping over the rough ruts. Old man knows how to handle all them bitches, flesh or tin, two-legged, four-legged, wheeled. I sweat beer in passion and promise them a kick in the tailpipe if they don't behave, and that gets them all. I'm so figuring ugly I turn their stomachs, but once they get a whiff of the out-of-this-world stink of me, they're done for. They fall prostrated at my big hair feet. That's the way it's always been with us Paley men and the Giaga women. That's why their men folks fear us, and why we got into so much trouble. Dorothy did not say anything, and Paley fell silent as soon as the truck swung off the dump and onto U.S. Route 24. He seemed to fold up into himself, to be trying to make himself as inconspicuous as possible. 
During the three minutes it took the truck to get from the shanty to the city limits, he kept wiping his sweating palm against his blue workman's shirt. But he did not try to release the tension with oaths. Instead, he muttered a string of what seemed to Dorothy nonsense rhymes. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, be a good guy, help me go. Hula, boola, teeny, weeny, ram em, dam em, figure em, duck em, watch me go. Don't be a schmo, stop em, block em, sing a go, go, go. Not until they had gone a mile into the city of Onabak and turned from twenty-four into an alley did he relax. Phew, that's torture, and I've been doing it ever since I was sixteen, some years ago. Today seems worse than ever, maybe cause you're along. Giaga men don't like it if they see me with one of their women, especially a cute chick like you. Suddenly he smiled and broke into a song about being covered all over with sweet violets sweeter than all the roses. He sang other songs, some of which made Dorothy turn red in the face, though at the same time she giggled. When they crossed the street to get from one alley to another, he cut off his singing, even in the middle of a phrase, and resumed it on the other side. Reaching the west bluff, he slowed the truck to a crawl while his little blue eyes searched the ash heaps and garbage cans at the rears of the houses. Presently he stopped the truck and climbed down to inspect his find. Guy in the sky were off to a flying start. Look, some old grates from a coal furnace and a pile of coke and beer bottles, all redeemable. Get down, Dorothy. If you want to know how us rag pickers make a living, you got to get in and sweat and cuss with us. And if you come across any hats, be sure to tell me. Dorothy smiled, but when she stepped down from the truck, she winced. What's the matter? Headache. The sun will boil it out. Here's how we do this collecting, see? The back end of the truck is boarded up into five sections. This section here is for the iron and the wood. This for the paper. This for the cardboard. You get a higher price for the cardboard. This for rags. This for bottles. We can get a refund on. If you find any interest in books or magazines, put them on the seat. I'll decide if I want to keep them or throw them in with the old paper. They worked swiftly and then drove on. About a block later, they were interrupted at another heap by a leaf of a woman withered and blown by the winds of time. She hobbled out from the back porch of a large three-storied house with diamond-shaped panes in the windows and doors and cupolas at the corners. In a quavering voice, she explained that she was the widow of a wealthy lawyer who had died fifteen years ago. Not until today had she made up her mind to get rid of his collection of law books and legal papers. These were all neatly cased in cardboard boxes, not too large to be handled. Not even, she added, her pale, watery eyes flickering from Paley to Dorothy, not even by a poor one-armed man and a young girl. Old man took off his Homburg and bowed. Sure, ma'am, my daughter and myself would be glad to help you out in your house cleaning. Your daughter, croaked the old woman. She don't look like me at all, he replied. No wonder. She's my foster daughter, poor girl. She was orphaned when she was still filling her diapers. My best friend was her father. He died saving my life, and as he laid gasping his life away in my arms, he begged me to take care of her as if she was my own. And I kept my promise to my dying friend. May his soul rest in peace. And even if I'm only a poor rag picker, ma'am, I've been doing my best to raise her to be a decent, God-fearing, obedient girl. Dorothy had to run around to the other side of the trunk, where she could cover her mouth and writhe in an agony of attempting to smother her laughter. When she regained control, the old lady was telling Paley she'd show him where the books were. Then she started hobbling to the porch. But old man, instead of following her across the yard, stopped by the fence that separated the alley from the backyard. He turned around and gave Dorothy a look of extreme despair. "'What's the matter?' she said. Why are you sweating so, and shaking, and you're so pale? You'd laugh if I told you, and I don't like to be laughed at. Tell me, I won't laugh. He closed his eyes and began muttering, Never mind, it's in the mind, never mind, you're just fine. Opening his eyes, he shook himself like a dog just come from the water. I can do it. I got the guts. All them books are a lot of beer money. 
I'll lose if I don't go down into the bowels of hell and get em. Guy in the sky, give me the guts of a goat, and the nerve of a pork dealer in Palestine. You know old man ain't got a yellow streak. It's the wicked spell of the false bokers working on me. Come on, let's go, go, go. And sucking in a deep breath, he stepped through the gateway. Head down, eyes on the grass at his feet, he shuffled toward the cellar door, where the old lady stood peering at him. Four steps away from the cellar entrance, he halted again. A small black spaniel had darted from around the corner of the house and begun yap-yapping at him. Old man suddenly cocked his head to one side, crossed his eyes, and deliberately sneezed. Yelping, the spaniel fled back around the corner, and Paley walked down the steps that led to the cool, dark basement. As he did so, he muttered, "'That puts the devil's spell on em, figurin' dogs!' When they had piled all the books in the back of the truck, he took off his Homburg and bowed again. "'Ma'am, my daughter and myself both thank you from the rock bottom are our poor but humble hearts for this treasure trove you give us. And if ever you've anything else you don't want and a strong back and a weak mind to carry it out, well, please remember we'll be down this alley every blue Monday and fish Friday about time the sun is three-quarters across the sky.' Providing it ain't raining, cause the old guy in the sky is crying in his beer over us poor mortals. What fools we be. Then he put his hat on, and the two got into the truck and chugged off. They stopped by several other promising heaps before he announced that the truck was loaded enough. He felt like celebrating. Perhaps they should stop off behind Mike's tavern and down a few quarts. She replied that perhaps she might manage a drink if she could have a whiskey. Beer wouldn't set well. "'I got some money,' rumbled old man, unbuttoning with slow, clumsy fingers his shirt pocket and pulling out a roll of worn, tattered bills while the truck's wheels rolled straight in the alley ruts. "'You brought me luck, so old man's gonna pay today through the hose. <laughs> I mean nose. Har, har, har. He stopped Fortiana behind a little neighborhood tavern. Dorothy, without being asked, took the two dollars he handed her and went into the building. She returned with a can opener, two quarts of beer, and a half pint of V.O. I added some of my money. I can't stand cheap whiskey. They sat on the running board of the truck, drinking, old man doing most of the talking. It wasn't long before he was telling her of the times when the real folk, the Paleys, had lived in Europe and Asia by the side of the woolly mammoths and the cave lion. We worshipped the old guy in the sky who says what the thunder says and lives in the east on the tallest mountain in the world. We faced the skulls our dead to the east so they could see the old guy when he came to take them to live with him in the mountain. And we was doing fine for a long, long time. Then out of the east come them mother-worshipping false folk with their long straight legs and long straight necks and flat faces and thunder-mug round heads and their bows and arrows. They claimed they was sons of the goddess Mother Earth, who was a virgin. But we claimed the truth was that a crow with stomach trouble sat on a stump and when it left the hot sun hatched him out. Now, well, for a while we beat him hands down because we was stronger. Every one of our women could tear their strongest man to bits. Still, they had that bow and arrow. They kept picking us off and moving in and moving in, and we kept moving back slowly. Till pretty soon we were shoved with our backs against the ocean. Then one day a big chief among us got a bright idea. Why don't we make bows and arrows too, he said. And so we did. But we was clumsy at making and shooting them because our hands were so big though we could draw a heavier bow in them. So we kept getting run out of the good hunting grounds. There was one thing might have been in our favor. That was, we bowled the women of the falsers over with our smell. Not that we smell good. We stink like a pig that's been making love to a billy goat on a manure pile. But somehow... The women folk of the falsers was all mixed up in their chemistry, I guess you'd call it, because they got all excited and developed round heels when they caught a whiff of us. If we'd been left alone with them, we could have don wand them falsers right off of the face of the earth. 
We would have mixed our blood with theirs so much that after a while you couldn't tell the difference, especially since the kids lean to their pa's side in looks. Paley blood is so much stronger. But that made sure there would always be war between us, especially after our king, old King Paley, made love to the daughter of the falser king, King Raw Boy, and stole her away. God, you should have seen the fuss then. Raw Boy's daughter flipped over old King Paley, and it was her giving the bright idea of calling in every able-bodied Paley that was left and organizing them into one big army. Kind of putting all our eggs in one basket, but it seemed a good idea. Every man big enough to carry a club went out in one big mob on Operation False Folk Massacre, and we ganged up on every little town of them mother-worshippers we found and kicked hell out of them and roasted the men's hearts and ate them and every now and then took a snack off the women and kids, too. Then all of a sudden we come to a big plain and there's an army of them false folk collected by old King Raw Boy. They outnumber us, but we feel we can lick the world, especially since the magic strength of the Gyaga lies in their women folk because they worship a woman god. The old woman of the earth. And we've got their chief priestess, Raw Boy's daughter. All our own personal power is collected in old King Paley's hat, his magical headpiece. All us Paley's believed that a man's strength in his soul was in his headpiece. We bed down the night before the big battle. At dawn there's a cry that'd wake up the dead. It still sends shivers down the necks of us Paley's fifty thousand years later. It's King Paley roaring and crying. We ask him why. He says that that dirty little sneaking little whore, Raw Boy's daughter, has stole his headpiece and run off with it to her father's camp. Our knees turn weak as near beer. Our manhood is in the hands of our enemies. But out we go to battle, our witch doctors out in front, rattling their gourds and whirling their bull roars and praying. And here comes the Gayaga medicine men doing the same. Only thing, their hearts is in their work, cause they got old King's headpiece stuck on the end of a spear. And for the first time they used dogs in war, too. Dogs never did like us any more than we like em. And then we charge into each other. Bang! Wallop! Crash! Smash! Whack! Ow! And they kick hell out of us. Do it to us. And we're never again the same. Done. Forever. They had old King's headpiece and with it our magic, cause we'd all put the soul of us Paley's in that hat. The spirit and power of us Paley's was prisoners, cause that headpiece was. And life became too much for us Paley's. Them as wasn't slaughtered and eaten was glad to settle down on the garbage heaps of the conquering falsers and pick for a living with the chickens, sometimes coming out second best. But we knew old King's headpiece was hidden somewhere, and we organized a secret society and swore to keep alive his name and to search for the headpiece if it took us forever. Which it almost has, it's been so long. But even though we was doomed to live in shanty towns and stay off the streets and prowl the junk piles in the alleys, we never gave up hope. And as time went on, some of the no-counts of the Gayaga came down to live with us, and we and they had kids. Soon, most of us had disappeared into the bloodstream of the low-class Gayaga, but there's always been a Paley family that tried to keep their blood pure. No man can do no more, can he? He glared at Dorothy. What do you think of that? Weakly, she said, Well, I've never heard anything like it. God Almighty, snorted old man, I give you a history longer than a whore's dream, more than fifty thousand years of history, the secret story of a long-lost race, and all you can say is that you'd never heard nothing like it before. He leaned toward her and clamped his huge hand over her thigh. Don't flinch from me, he said fiercely, or turn your head away. Sure I stink, and I offend your dainty figurin' nostrils and upset your figurin' delicate little guts. But what's a minute's whiff of me on your part compared to a lifetime on my part to having all the stinkin' garbage in the universe shoved up my nose? 
and my mouth filled with what you wouldn't say if your mouth was full of it. What do you say to that, huh? Coolly, she said, please take your hand off me. Sure, I didn't mean nothing by it. I got carried away and forgot my place in society. Now look here, she said earnestly, that has nothing at all to do with your so-called social position. It's just that I don't allow anybody to take liberties with my body. Maybe I'm being ridiculously Victorian, but I want more than just sensuality. I want love and... Okay, I get the idea. Dorothy stood up and said, I'm only a block from my apartment. I think I'll walk on home. The liquor's given me a headache. Yeah, he growled. You sure it's the liquor and not me? She looked steadily at him. I'm going, but I'll see you tomorrow morning. Does that answer your question? Okay, he grunted. See ya. Maybe. She walked away very fast. Next morning, shortly after dawn, a sleepy-eyed Dorothy stopped her car before the Paley shanty. Dina was the only one home. Gummy had gone to the river to fish. An old man was in the outhouse. Dorothy took the opportunity to talk to Dina and found her, as she had suspected, a woman of considerable education. However, although she was polite, she was reticent about her background. Dorothy, in an effort to keep the conversation going, mentioned that she had phoned her former anthropology professor and asked him about the chances of old man being a genuine Neanderthal. It was then that Dina broke her reserve and eagerly asked what the professor had thought. Well, said Dorothy, he just laughed. He told me it was an absolute impossibility that a small group, even an inbred group, isolated in the mountains, could have kept their cultural and genetic identity for fifty thousand years. I argued with him. I told him old man insisted he and his kind had existed in the village of Paley in the mountains of the Pyrenees until Napoleon's men found them and tried to draft them. Then they fled to America, after a stay in England, and his group was split up during the Civil War, driven out of the Great Smokies. He, as far as he knows, is the last pure breed, Gummy being a half or quarter breed. The professor assured me that Gummy and Old Man were cases of glandular malfunctioning, of acromegaly, that they may have a superficial resemblance to the Neanderthal man, but a physical anthropologist could tell the difference at a glance. When I got a little angry and asked him if he wasn't taking an unscientific and prejudiced attitude, he became rather irritated. Our talk ended somewhat frostily. But I went down to the university library that night and read everything on what makes Homo neanderthalensis different from Homo sapiens. You almost sound as if you believe old man's private little myth is the truth, said Dina. The professor taught me to be convinced only by the facts and not to say anything is impossible, replied Dorothy. If he's forgotten his own teachings, I haven't. Well, old man is a persuasive talker, said Dina. He could sell the devil a harp and halo. Old man, wearing only a pair of blue jeans, entered the shanty. For the first time, Dorothy saw his naked chest, huge, covered with long red-gold hairs so numerous they formed a matting almost as thick as an orangutan's. However, it was not his chest, but his bare feet at which she looked most intently. Yes, the big toes were widely separated from the others, and he certainly tended to walk on the outside of his feet. His arm, too, seemed abnormally short in proportion to his body. Old man grunted a good morning and didn't say much for a while. But after he had sweated and cursed and chanted his way through the streets of Onabak and had arrived safely at the alleys of the West Bluff, he relaxed. Perhaps he was helped by finding a large pile of papers and rags. Well, here we go to work, so don't you dare to shirk. Jump, Dorothy! By the sweat of your brow, you'll earn your brew. When that load was on the truck, they drove off. Paley said, How you like this life without no strife? Good, huh? You like alleys, huh? Dorothy nodded. As a child, I liked alleys better than streets. And they still preserve something of their first charm for me. They were more fun to play in, so nice and cozy. The trees and bushes and fences leaned in at you and sometimes touched you as if they had hands and liked to feel your face to find out if you'd been there before, and they remembered you. 
You felt as if you were sharing a secret with the alleys and the things of the alleys. But streets, well, streets were always the same, and you had to watch out the cars didn't run you over, and the windows in the houses were full of faces and eyes poking their noses in your business, if you can say that eyes had noses. The old man whopped and slapped his thigh so hard it would have broke if it had been Dorothy's. You must be a paley. We feel that way, too. We ain't allowed to hang around streets, so we make our alleys into little kingdoms. Tell me, do you sweat just crossing a street from one alley to the next? He put his hand on her knee. She looked down at it, but said nothing, and he left it there while the truck put putted along, its wheels following the ruts of the alley. No, I don't feel that way at all. Yeah, but when you was a kid, you wasn't so ugly you had to stay off the streets. But I still wasn't too happy in the alleys because of them figurin' dogs. Forever and ever, they was barkin' and bitin' at me. So I took to beatin' the bejesus out of them with a big stick I always carried. But after a while, I found out I only had to look at them in a certain way. Yay, yay, yay! They'd run away yapping, like that old black spaniel did yesterday. Why? Because they knew I was sneezing evil spirits at them. It was then I began to know I wasn't human. Of course, my old man had been telling me that ever since I could talk. As I grew up, I felt every day that the spell of the Kiaga was getting stronger. I was getting dirtier and dirtier looks from him on the streets. And when I went down the alleys, I felt like I really belonged there. Finally, the day came when I count cross the street without getting sweaty hands and cold feet and a dry mouth and breathing hard. That was because I was becoming a full-grown Paley, and the curse of the Gayaga gets more powerful as you get more hair on your chest. Curse, said Dorothy. Some people call it a neurosis. It's a curse. Dorothy didn't answer. Again, she looked down at her knee, and this time he removed his hand. He would have had to do it anyway, for they had come to a paved street. On the way down to the junk dealers, he continued the same theme— and when they got to the shanty, he elaborated upon it. During the thousands of years the Paley lived on the garbage piles of the Giaga, they were closely watched. So in the old days it had been the custom for the priests and warriors of the false folk to descend on the dump-heap dwellers whenever a strong and obstreperous Paley came to manhood, and they had gouged out an eye or cut off his hand or leg or some other member to ensure that he remembered what he was and where his place was. That's why I lost this arm, the old man growled, waving the stump. Fear the Giaga, for the Paley did this to me. Dina howled with laughter and said, Dorothy, the truth is that he got drunk one night and passed out on the railroad tracks, and a freight train ran over his arm. Sure, sure, that's the way it was. But it couldn't have happened if the Falsers didn't work through their evil black magic. Nowadays, instead of crippling us openly, they use spells. They ain't got the guts any more to do it themselves. Dina laughed scornfully and said, He got all those psychopathic ideas from reading those comics and weird tale magazines and those crackpot books and from watching the TV program Alley Oop and the Dinosaur. I can point out every story from which he's stolen an idea. You're a liar, thundered old man. He struck Dina on the shoulder. She reeled away from the blow, then leaned back toward him as if into a strong wind. He struck her again, this time across her purple birthmark. Her eyes glowed, and she cursed him, and he hit her once more, hard enough to hurt but not to injure. Dorothy opened her mouth as if to protest, but Gummy lay a fat, sweaty hand on her shoulder and lifted her finger to her own lips. Dina fell to the floor from a particularly violent blow. She did not stand up again. Instead, she got to her hands and knees and crawled toward the refuge behind the big iron stove. His naked foot shoved her rear so that she was sent sprawling on her face, moaning, her long, stringy black hair falling over her face and birthmark. Dorothy stepped forward and raised her hand to grab old man. Gummy stopped her, mumbling, "'It's all right. Leave him alone.' "'Look at that figure and female being happy,' snorted old man. You know why I have to beat the hell out of her, when all I want is peace and quiet? Because I look like a figuring caveman, and they're supposed to beat their whores silly. 
That's why she took up with me. You're an insane liar, said Dina softly from behind the stove, slowly and dreamily nursing her pain like the memory of a lover's caresses. I came to live with you because I'd sunk so low you were the only man that'd have me. She's a retired high society mainliner, Dorothy, said Paley. You never seen her without a long-sleeved dress on. That's cause her arms are full of holes. It was me that kicked the monkey off of her back. I cured her with the wisdom and magic of the real folk, where you coax the evil spirit out by talking it out. And she's been living with me ever since. Can't get rid of her. Now you take that toothless bag there. I ain't never hit her. That shows I ain't no woman-beaten bastard, right? I hit Dina cause she likes it, wants it. But I don't ever hit Gummy. Hey, Gummy, that kind of medicine ain't what you want, is it? And he laughed his incredibly hoarse, whore, whore, whore. You're a figurin' liar, said Gummy, speaking over her shoulder because she was squatting down, fiddling with the TV controls. You're the one knocked most of my teeth out. I knocked out a few rotten stumps you was gonna lose anyway. You had it coming cause you was running around with that old Brian in his green shirt. Gummy giggled and said, Don't think for a minute I quit going with that O'Brien in his green shirt just cause you slapped me around a little bit. I quit cause you was a better man than him. Gummy giggled again. She rose and waddled across the room toward a shelf which held a bottle of her cheap perfume. Her enormous brass earrings swung and her great hips swung back and forth. Look at that, said old man, like two bags of mush in a windstorm but his eyes followed them with kindling appreciation. And on seeing her pour that reeking liquid over her pillow-sized bosom, he hugged her and buried his huge nose in the valley of her breasts and sniffed rapturously. I feel like a dog that's found an old bone he buried and forgot till just now, he growled. Arf, arf, arf. Dina snorted and said she had to get some fresh air or she'd lose her supper. She grabbed Dorothy's hand and insisted she take a walk with her. Dorothy, looking sick, went with her. The following evening, as the four were drinking beer around the kitchen table, old man suddenly reached over and touched Dorothy affectionately. Gummy laughed, but Dina glared. However, she did not say anything to the girl, but instead began accusing Paley of going too long without a bath. He called her a flat-chested hophead and said that she was lying because he had been taking a bath every day. Dina replied that yes, he had, ever since Dorothy had appeared on the scene. An argument raged. Finally he rose from the table and turned the photograph of Dina's mother so it faced the wall. Wailing, Dina tried to face it outward again. He pushed her away from it, refusing to hit her despite her insults, even when she howled at him that he wasn't fit to lick her mother's shoes, let alone blaspheme her portrait by touching it. Tired of the argument, he abandoned his post by the photograph and shuffled to the refrigerator. If you dare turn her around till I give the word, I'll throw her in the creek, and you'll never see her again. Dina shrieked and crawled under her blanket behind the stove, and there lay sobbing and cursing him softly. Gummy chewed tobacco and laughed, while a brown stream ran down her toothless jaws. Dina pushed him too far that time. And her and her figure and mother, snorted Paley. Hey, Dorothy, you know how she laughs at me because I think Forty Anna's got a soul, and I put the evil eye on them hounds? And cause I think the salvation us Paleys will be when we find out where old King's hat's been hidden? Well, get a load of this. This here intellectual purple-faced dragon, this retired mainliner, this old broken-down nag for a monkey jockey, she's the superstitious one. She thinks her mother's a god, and she prays to her and asks forgiveness and asks what's going to happen in the future. And when she thinks nobody's around, she talks to her. Here she is, worshipping her mother like the old woman in the earth. Who's the old guy's enemy? And she knows that makes the old guy sore. 
Maybe that's the reason he ain't allowed me to find the long-lost headpiece of old king, though he knows I've been looking in every ash heap from here to God knows where, hoping some fool Giaga would throw it away, never realizing what it was. Well, by all that's holy, that picture stays with its ugly face on the wall. Ah, shut up, Dina. I want to watch Alley-Oop. Shortly afterward, Dorothy drove home. There she again phoned her sociology professor. Impatiently, he went into more detail. He said that one reason old man's story of the war between the Neanderthals and the invading Homo sapiens was very unlikely was that there was evidence to indicate that Homo sapiens might have been in Europe before the Neanderthals. It was very possible the Homo neanderthalensis was the invader. Not invader in the modern sense, said the professor. The influx of a new species or race or tribe into Europe during the Paleolithic would have been a sporadic migration of little groups, an immigration which might have taken a thousand to ten thousand years to complete. And it is more than likely that Neanderthalensis and Sapiens lived side by side for millennia with very little fighting between them because both were too busy struggling for a living. For one reason or another, probably because he was outnumbered, the Neanderthal was absorbed by the surrounding peoples. Some anthropologists have speculated that the Neanderthals were blondes and that they had passed their light hair directly to North Europeans. Whatever the guesses and surmises, concluded the professor, it would be impossible for such a distinctly different minority to keep its special physical and cultural characteristics over a period of half a hundred millennia. Paley has concocted this personal myth to compensate for his extreme ugliness, his inferiority, his feelings of rejection. The elements of the myth came from the comic books and TV. However, concluded the professor, in view of your youthful enthusiasm and naivete, I will consider my judgment if you bring me some physical evidence of his Neanderthaloid origin. Say you could show me that he had a tarodent tooth. I'd be flabbergasted, to say the least. But, Professor, she pleaded, why can't you give him a personal examination? One look at old man's foot would convince you, I'm sure. My dear, I am not addicted to wild goose chases. My time is valuable. That was that. The next day she asked old man if he had ever lost a molar tooth or had an X-ray made of one. No, he said. I got more sound teeth and brains, and I ain't going to lose them. As long as I keep my headpiece, I'll keep my teeth and my digestion and my manhood. What's more, I'll keep my good sense, too. The loose screw tighteners at the state hospital really gave me a good going over, fore and aft, up and down, in and out, all night long. They'll never take a hotel room right by the elevator. And they proved I wasn't hatched in a cuckoo clock, even though they tore their hair and said something must be wrong especially after we had that row about my hat. I wouldn't let them take my blood for a test, you know, because I figured they was going to mix it with water, the Yaga magic, and turn my blood to water. Somehow that Elkins got wise that I had to wear my hat, because I wouldn't take it off when I undressed for the physical, I guess. And he snatched my hat, and I was done for. Stealing it was stealing my soul. All Paley's wears their souls in their hats. I had to get it back. So I ate humble pie. I let them poke and pry all over and take my blood. There was a pause while Paley breathed in deeply to get power to launch another verbal rocket. Dorothy, who had been struck by an idea, said, Speaking of hats, old man, what does this hat that the daughter of Raw Boy stole from King Paley look like? Would you recognize it if you saw it? The old man stared at her with wide blue eyes for a moment before he exploded. Would I recognize it? Would the dog that sat by the railroad tracks recognize his tail after the locomotive cut it off? Would you recognize your own blood if somebody stuck you in the guts with a knife and it pumped out with every heartbeat? Certainly I would recognize the hat of old King Paley. Every Paley at his mother's knees gets a detailed description of it. You want to hear about the hat? Well, hang on, chick, and I'll describe every hair and bone it. Dorothy told herself more than once that she should not be doing this. If she was trusted by old man, she was in one sense a false friend. But she reassured herself in another sense she was helping him. 
Should he find the hat, he might blossom forth, actually tear himself loose from the taboos that bound him to the dump heap, to the alleys, to fear of dogs, to the conviction he was an inferior and oppressed citizen. Moreover, Dorothy told herself it would aid her scientific studies to record his reactions. The taxidermist she hired to locate the necessary materials and fashion them into the desired shape was curious, but she told him it was for an anthropological exhibit in Chicago, and that it was meant to represent the headpiece of the medicine man of an Indian secret society dedicated to phallic mysteries. The taxidermist sniggered and said he'd give his eye teeth to see those ceremonies. Dorothy's intentions were helped by the run of good luck old man had in his alley picking while she rode with him. Exultant, he swore he was headed for some extraordinary find. He could feel his good fortune building up. It's going to hit, he said, grinning with his huge, widely spaced gravestone teeth. Like lightning. Two days later, Dorothy rose even earlier than usual and drove to a place behind the house of a well-known doctor. She had read in the society column that he and his family were vacationing in Alaska, so she knew they wouldn't be wondering at finding a garbage can already filled with garbage and a big cardboard box full of cast-off clothes. Dorothy had brought the refuse from her own apartment to make it seem as if the house were occupied. The old garments, with one exception, she had purchased at a Salvation Army store. About nine that morning she and old man drove down the alley on their scheduled route, Old man was first off the truck. Dorothy hung back to let him make the discovery. Old man picked the garments out of the box one by one. Here's a velvet dress Dina can wear. She's been complaining she hasn't had a new dress in a long time. And here's a blouse and skirt big enough to wrap around an elephant. Gummy can wear it. And here... He lifted up a tall conical hat with a wide brim and two balls of felted horse mane attached to the band. It was a strange headpiece, fashioned of roan horsehide over a ribwork of split bones. It must have been the only one of its kind in the world, and it certainly looked out of place in the alley of a mid-Illinois city. Old man's eyes bugged out, then they rolled up and he fell to the ground as if shot. The hat, however, was still clutched in his hand. Dorothy was terrified. She had expected any reaction but this. If he had suffered a heart attack, it would, she thought, be her fault. Fortunately, old man had only fainted. However, when he regained consciousness, he did not go into ecstasies as she had expected. Instead, he looked at her, his face gray, and said, It can't be. It must be a trick. The old woman in the earth's playing on me so she can have the last laugh on me. How could it be the hat to old King Paley's? Wouldn't the Kiaga that been keeping it in their family all these years know what it is? Probably not, said Dorothy. After all, the Giaga, as you call them, don't believe in magic any more. Or it might be that the present owner doesn't even know what it is. Maybe. More likely it was thrown out by accident during house cleaning. You know how stupid them women are. Anyway, let's take it and get going. The old guy in the sky might have uh, had a hand in fixing up this deal for me. And if he did, it's better not to ask questions. Let's go. Old man seldom wore the hat. When he was home, he put it in the parrot cage and locked the cage door with the bicycle lock. At nights, the cage hung from the stand. Days, it sat on the seat of the truck. Old man wanted it always where he could see it. Finding it had given him a tremendous optimism, a belief he could do anything. He sang and laughed even more than he had before, and he was even able to venture out onto the streets for several hours at a time before the sweat and shakings began. Gummy, seeing the hat, merely grunted and made a lewd remark about its appearance. Dina smiled grimly and said, Why haven't the horse hide and bones rotted away long ago? That's just the kind of question a Gayaga dummy like you'd ask, said old man, snorting. How can the hat rot when there's a million paley souls crowded into it, standing room only? There ain't even elbow room for germs. Besides, the horse hide and the bones are jam-packed with the power and the glory of all the Paleys that died before our battle with Raw Boy, and all the souls that died since. It's seething with soul energy, the lid held on it by the magic of a Gayaga. Better watch out, it don't blow up and wipe us all out, said Gummy, snickering. 
Now you have the hat. What are you going to do with it? Asked Dina. I don't know. I'll have to sit down with beer and study the situation. Suddenly Dina began laughing shrilly. My God, you've been thinking for fifty thousand years about this hat, and now you've got it. You don't know what to do about it. Well, I'll tell you what you'll do about it. You'll get to thinking big, all right. You'll conquer the world, rid it of all false folk, all right. You fool! Even if your story isn't the raving of a lunatic, it would still be too late for you. You're alone, the last one against two billion. Don't worry, world. This rag-picking Ramesses, this Ali Alexander, this junkyard Julius Caesar—he isn't going to conquer you. No, he's going to put on his hat and he's going forth to do what? To become a wrestler on TV. That's what. That's the height of his half-wit ambition: to be billed as the one-armed Neanderthal, the awful ape man. That is the culmination of fifty thousand years. Ha ha ha! The others looked apprehensively at old man, expecting him to strike Dina. Instead, he removed the hat from the cage, put it on, and sat down at the table with a quart of beer in his hand. "Quit your cackling, you old hen," he said. "I got my thinking cap on." The next day, Paley, despite a hangover, was in a very good mood. He chattered all the way to the West Bluff, and once stopped the truck so he could walk back and forth on the street and show Dorothy he wasn't afraid. Then, boasting he could lick the world, he drove the truck up an alley and halted it by the backyard of a huge but somewhat run-down mansion. Dorothy looked at him curiously. He pointed to the jungle-thick shrubbery that filled a corner of the yard. Looks like a rabbit couldn't get in there, huh? But old man knows things the rabbit don't. Follow me. Carrying the caged hat, he went to the shrubbery, dropped to all threes, and began inching his way through a very narrow passage. Dorothy stood looking dubiously into the tangle until a hoarse growl came from its depths. "You scared? Or is your fanny too broad to get through here?" "I'll try anything once," she announced cheerfully. In a short time, she was crawling on her belly. Then had come suddenly into a little clearing. Old man was standing up. The cage was at his feet, and he was looking at a red rose in his hand. She sucked in her breath. Roses, peonies, violets. Sure, Dorothy, he said, swelling out his chest. Paley's Garden of Eden, his secret hot house. I found this place a couple of years ago when I was looking for a place to hide. If the cops was looking for me, or I just wanted a place to be alone from everybody. Including myself, I planted these rose bushes in here and these other flowers. I come here every now and then to check on 'em, spray 'em, prune 'em. I never take any home, even though I'd like to give Dina some. But Dina ain't no dummy. She'd know I was getting 'em out of a garbage pail, and I just didn't want to tell her about this place or anybody. He looked directly at her, as if to catch every twitch of a muscle in her face, every repressed emotion. You're the only person besides myself knows about this place. He held out the rose to her. Here, it's yours. Thank you. I am proud, really proud, that you've shown this place to me. Really are. That makes me feel good. In fact, great. It's amazing, this spot of beauty, and and I'll finish it for you. You never thought the ugliest man in the world a dump heap, or a man that ain't even a man or a human being. Ah,、uh, I hate the word. A Neanderthal could appreciate the beauty of a rose, right? Well, I growed these because I love 'em. Look, Dorothy, look at this rose. It's round. Not like a ball, but a flattened roundness, oval, sure. And look at the petals, how they fold in on one another, how they're arranged, like one ring of red towers protecting the next ring of red towers, protecting the gold cup on the inside, the precious source of life, the treasure. Or maybe that's the golden hair of the princess of the castle. Maybe. And look at the bright green leaves under the rose. Beautiful, huh? 
The old guy knew what he was doing when he made these. He was an artist then. Thought he must have been suffering from a hangover when he shaped me, huh? His hands were shaky that day. And he gave up after a while and never bothered to finish me, but went on down to the corner for some of the hair of the dog that bit him. Suddenly tears filled Dorothy's eyes. You shouldn't feel that way. You've got beauty, sensitivity, a genuine feeling. Under, under this, he said, pointing his finger at his face. Sure, forget it. Anyway, look at these green buds on these baby roses. Pretty, huh? Fresh with promise of the beauty to come. They're shaped like the breasts, a young virgin's. He took a step toward her and put his arm around her shoulders. Dorothy. She put her hands on his chest and gently tried to shove herself away. Please, she whispered, please don't. Not after you've shown me how fine you really can be. What do you mean, he said, not releasing her. Ain't what I want to do with you just as fine and beautiful a thin as this rose here? And if you really feel for me, you'd want to let your flesh say what your mind thinks like the flowers when they open up for the sun. She shook her head. No, it can't be. Please. I feel terrible because I can't say yes, but I can't. I, you, there's too much dip. Sure, we're different. Going in different directions and then coming around the corner, bam, we run into each other and we wrap our arms around each other to keep from falling. He pulled her to him so her face was pressed against his chest. See, he rumbled, like this. Now breathe deep. Don't turn your head. Sniff away. Lock yourself to me like we was glued and nothing could pull us apart. Breathe deep. I come arm around you, like these trees around these flowers. I'm not hurting you. I'm giving you life and protecting you. Right? Breathe deep. Please, she whimpered, don't hurt me. Gently, gently it is, I won't hurt you. Not too much. That's right, don't hold yourself stiff against me like a stone. That's right, melt like butter. I'm not forcing you, Dorothy, remember that. You want this, don't you? Don't hurt me, she whispered. You're so strong. Oh, my God, so strong. For two days, Dorothy did not appear at the Paley's. The third morning, in an effort to fire her courage, she downed two double shots of V.O. before breakfast. When she drove to the dump heap, she told the two women that she had not been feeling well, but she had returned because she wanted to finish her study, as it was almost at an end, and her superiors were anxious to get her report. Paley, though he did not smile when he saw her, said nothing. However, he kept looking at her out of the corners of his eyes when he thought she was watching him and though he took the hat in its cage with him, he sweated and shook as before while crossing streets. Dorothy sat staring straight ahead, unresponding to the few remarks he did make. Finally, cursing under his breath, he abandoned his efforts to work as usual and drove to the hidden garden. Here we are, he said. Adam and Eve returning to Eden. He peered from beneath the bony ridges of his brows at the sky. We better hurry in. Looks as if the old guy got up on the wrong side of the bed. There's going to be a storm. I'm not going in there with you, said Dorothy. Not now or ever. Even after what we did, even if you said you loved me, I still make you sick, he said. You sure didn't act then like old ugly made you sick. I haven't been able to sleep for two nights, she said tonelessly. I've asked myself a thousand times why I did it, and each time I could only tell myself I didn't know. Something seemed to leap from you to me and take me over. I was powerless. You certainly wasn't paralyzed, said old man, placing his hand on her knee. And if you was powerless, it was because you wanted to be. It's no use talking, she said. You'll never get a chance again, and take your hand off me. It makes my flesh crawl. He dropped his hand. All right. Back to business. Back to picking people's piles of junk. 
Let's get out of here. Forget what I said. Forget this garden, too. Forget the secret I told you. Don't tell nobody. The dump heapers would laugh at me. Imagine old man Paley, the one-armed candidate for the puzzle factory, the fugitive from the old Stone Age, growing peonies and roses. Big laugh, huh? Dorothy did not reply. He started the truck, and as they emerged onto the alley, they saw the sun disappear behind the clouds. The rest of the day it did not come out, and old man and Dorothy did not speak to each other. As they were going down Route 24, after unloading at the junk dealers, they were stopped by a patrolman. He ticketed Paley for not having a chauffeur's license and made Paley follow him downtown to court. Their old man had to pay a fine of twenty-five dollars. This, to everybody's amazement, he produced from his pocket. As if that weren't enough, he had to endure the jibes of the police and the courtroom loafers. Evidently, he had appeared in the police station before and was known as King Kong, alley-oop, or just plain chimp. Old man trembled, whether with suppressed rage or nervousness, Dorothy could not tell. But later, as Dorothy drove him home, he almost frothed at the mouth in a tremendous outburst of rage. By the time they were within sight of his shanty, he was shouting that his life savings had been wiped out and that it was all a plot by the Giaga to beat him down to starvation. It was then that the truck's motor died. Cursing old man jerked the hood open so savagely that one rusty hinge broke. Further enraged by this, he tore the hood completely off and threw it away into the ditch by the roadside. Unable to find the cause of the breakdown, he took a hammer from the tool chest and began to beat the sides of the truck. I'll make her go, 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 he shouted, or she'll wish she had. Run, you bitch, purr, eat gasoline, rumble your damn belly and eat gasoline, but run, run, run. Well, your ex-lover old man sells you for junk, I swear it. Undaunted, Fortiana did not move. Eventually, Paley and Dorothy had to leave the truck by the ditch and walk home. And as they crossed the heavily traveled highway to get to the dump heap, old man was forced to jump to keep from getting hit by a car. He shook his fist at the speeding auto. I know you're out to get me, he howled, but you won't. You've been trying for fifty thousand years, and you ain't made it yet. We're still fighting. At that moment, the black, sagging bellies of the clouds overhead ruptured. The two were soaked before they could take four steps. Thunder bellowed, and lightning slammed into the earth on the other end of the dump heap. Old man growled with fright, but seeing he was untouched, he raised his fist to the sky. Okay! Okay, so you got it in for me, too! I get it! Okay! Okay! Dripping, the two entered the shanty where he opened a quart of beer and began drinking. Dina took Dorothy behind a curtain and gave her a towel to dry herself with and one of her white terrycloth robes to put on. By the time Dorothy came out from behind the curtain, she found old man opening his third quart. He was accusing Dina of not frying the fish correctly, and when she answered him sharply, he began accusing her of every fault, big or small, real or imaginary, of which he could think. In fifteen minutes he was nailing the portrait of her mother to the wall with its face inward, and she was whimpering behind the stove and tenderly stroking the spots where he had struck her. Gummy protested, and he chased her out into the rain. Dorothy at once put her wet clothes on and announced she was leaving. She'd walk the mile into town and catch the bus. Old man snarled, Go! You're too snotty for us anyway. We ain't your kind, and that's that. Don't go, pleaded Dina. If you're not here to restrain him, he'll be terrible to us. I'm sorry, said Dorothy. I should have gone home this morning. You sure should, he growled, and then began weeping, his pushed-out lips fluttering like a bird's wings, his face twisted like a gargoyle's. Get out before I forget myself and throw you out, he sobbed. Dorothy, with pity on her face, shut the door gently behind her. The following day was Sunday. That morning her mother phoned her. She was coming down from Waukegan to visit her. Could she take Monday off? Dorothy said yes, and then, sighing, she called her supervisor. She told him she had all the data she needed for the Paley report and that she would begin typing it out. Monday night, after seeing her mother off on the train, she decided to pay the Paley's a farewell visit. 
She could not endure another sleepless night, filled with fighting the desire to get out of bed again and again, to scrub herself clean, and the pain of having to face old man and the two women in the morning. She felt that if she said good-bye to the Paley, she could say farewell to those feelings, too, or at least time would wash them away more quickly. The sky had been clear, star-filled, when she left the railroad station. By the time she had reached the dump heap, clouds had swept out from the west, and a blinding rainstorm was deluging the city. Going over the bridge, she saw by the lights of her headlamps that the Kickapoo Creek had become a small river in the two days of heavy rains. Its muddy, frothing current roared past the dump and on down to the Illinois River, a half-mile away. So high had it risen that the waters lapped at the doorsteps of the shanties. The trucks and jalopies parked outside them were piled high with household goods, and their owners were ready to move at a minute's notice. Dorothy parked her car a little off the road because she did not want to get it stuck in the mire. By the time she had walked to the Paley shanty, she was in stinking mud up to her calves, and night had fallen. In the light streaming from a window stood Fortiana, which old man had apparently succeeded in getting started. Unlike the other vehicles, it was not loaded. Dorothy knocked on the door and was admitted by Dina. Paley was sitting in the ragged easy chair. He was clad only in a pair of faded and patched blue jeans. One eye was surrounded by a big black, blue, and green bruise. The horsehide hat of old King was firmly jammed under his head, and one hand clutched the neck of a quart of beer as if he were choking it to death. Dorothy looked curiously at the black eye, but did not comment on it. Instead, she asked him why he hadn't packed for a possible flood. Old man waved the naked stump of his arm at her. It's the doings of the old guy in the sky. I prayed to the old idiot to stop the rain, but it rained harder than ever. So I figure it's really the old woman in the earth who's kicking up this rain. The old guy's too feeble to stop her. He needs strength. So... I thought about pouring out the blood a uh, virgin to him so he can lap it up and get his muscles back with that. But I give that up because there ain't no such thin any more. Not within a hundred miles of here, anyway. So I've been thinking about going outside and doing the next best thing. That is pouring a quart or two of beer out on the ground for him. What the Greeks call pouring a liberation to the gods. Don't let him drink none of that cheap beer, warned Gummy. This rain falling on us is bad enough. I don't want no god puking all over the place. He hurled the quart at her. It was empty because he wasn't so far gone. He'd waste a full or even half full bottle. But it was smashed against the wall, and since it was worth a nickel's refund, he accused Gummy of malicious waste. If you'd have held still, it wouldn't have broke. Dina paid no attention to the scene. I'm pleased to see you, child, she said. But it might have been better if you had stayed home tonight. She gestured at the picture of her mother, still nailed face inward. He's not come out of his evil mood yet. You can say that again, mumbled Gummy. He got a pistol whipping from that young limpy doolin who lives in that packin' box house with the Jansen bathing suit ad pasted on the side when Limpy tried to grab old King's hat off old man's head just for fun. Yeah, he tried to grab it, said Paley, but I slapped his hand hard. Then he pulls a gun out of his coat pocket with the other hand and hit me in this eye with his butt. That don't stop me. He sees me coming at him like I'm late for work, and he says he'll shoot me if I touch him again. My old man didn't raise no silly son, so I don't charge him. But I'll get him sooner or later, and he'll be limping in both legs if he walks at all. But I don't know why I never had nothing but bad luck ever since I got this hat. It ain't supposed to be that way. It's supposed to be bringing me all the good luck the Paveys ever had. He glared at Dorothy and said, Do you know what? I had good luck until I showed you that place, you know, the flowers. And then, after you know what, everything went sour as old milk. What'd you do? Take the power out of me by doing what you did? Did the old woman in the earth send you to me so you'd draw the muscle and luck and life out of me if I found the hat when old guy placed it in my path? He lurched up from the easy chair, 
clutched two quarts of beer from the refrigerator to his chest and staggered toward the door. Can't stand the smell in here. Talk about my smell. I'm sweet violets compared to the fish, as some of you. I'm going out where the air's fresh. I'm going out and talk to the old guy in the sky, hear what the thunder has to say to me. He understands me. He don't give a damn if I'm an ugly old man that's half ape. Swiftly, Dina ran in front of him and held out her claws at him like a gaunt, enraged alley cat. So that's it. You've had the indecency to insult this young girl, you evil beast. Old man halted, swayed, carefully deposited the two quarts on the floor. Then he shuffled to the picture of Dina's mother and ripped it from the wall. The nails screeched. So did Dina. What are you going to do? Something I've been wanting to do for a long, long time. Only I felt sorry for you. Now I don't. I'm going to throw this idol of yours into the creek. Now why? Because I think she's a delegate to the old woman in the earth. Old guy's enemy. She's been sent here to watch on me and report to old woman of what I was doing. And you're the one brought her in this house. Over my dead body you'll throw that in the creek, screamed Dina. Have it your way, he growled, lurching forward and driving her to one side with his shoulder. Dina grabbed at the frame of the picture he held in his hand, but he hit her over the knuckles with it. Then he lowered it to the floor, keeping it from falling over with his leg while he bent over and picked up the two quarts in his huge hand. Clutching them, he squatted until his stump was level with the top part of the frame. The stump clamped down over the upper part of the frame. He straightened, holding it tightly, lurched toward the door, and was gone into the driving rain and crashing lightning. Dina stared into the darkness for a moment, then ran after him. Stunned, Dorothy watched them go. Not until she heard Gummy mumbling, They'll kill each other, was Dorothy able to move. She ran to the door, looked out, turned back to Gummy. What's got into him, she cried. He's so cruel, yet I know he has a soft heart. Why must he be this way? It's you, said Gummy. He thought it didn't matter how he looked. What he did, he was still a paley. He thought his sweat would get you like it did all them chicks he was bragging about. No matter how uppity the sweet young Finn was. And you hurt him when you didn't dig him. Especially cause he thought more of you than anybody before. Why do you think life's been so miserable for us since he found you? What the hell, a man's a man. He's always got the eye for the chicks, right? Dina didn't see that. Dina hates old man. But Dina can't do without him either. I have to stop them, said Dorothy, and she plunged out into the black and white world. Just outside the door she halted, bewildered. Behind her light streamed from the shanty, and to the north was a dim glow from the city of Onabak. But elsewhere was darkness, darkness except when the lightning burned away the night for a dazzling, frightening second. She ran around the shanty toward the Kickapoo, some fifty yards away. She was sure that they'd be somewhere by the back of the creek. Halfway to the stream, another flash showed her a white figure by the bank. It was Dina in her terrycloth robe, Dina now sitting up in the mud, bending forward, shaking with sobs. I got down on my knees, she moaned, to him, to him, and I begged him to spare my mother. But he said I'd thank him later for freeing me from worshipping a false goddess. He said I'd kiss his hand. Dina's voice rose to a scream. And then he did it. He tore my blessed mother to bits. Threw in the creek. I'll kill him. I'll kill him. Dorothy patted Dina's shoulder. There, there, you'd better get back to the house and get dry. It's a bad thing he's done, but he's not in his right mind. Where'd he go? Toward that clump of cottonwoods where the creek runs into the river. You go back, said Dorothy. I'll handle him. I can do it. Dina seized her hand. Stay away from him. He's hiding in the woods now. He's dangerous, dangerous as a wounded boar, or as one of his ancestors were when they were hurt and hunted by others. Ours, said Dorothy. You mean you believe his story? Not all of it, just part. 
That tale of his about the mass invasion of Europe and King Paley's hat is nonsense, or at least it's been distorted through God only knows how many thousands of years. But it's true he's at least part Neanderthal. Listen, I've fallen low. I'm only a junk man's whore. Not even that now. Old man never touches me any more except to hit me. And that's not his fault, really. I ask for it. I want it. But I'm not a moron. I got books from the library, read what they say about the Neanderthal. I studied old man carefully, and I know he must be what he says he is. Gummy, too. She's at least a quarter breed. Dorothy pulled her hand out of Dina's grip. I have to go. I have to talk to old man. Tell him I'm not seeing him any more. Stay away from him, pleaded Dina, again seizing Dorothy's hand. You'll go to talk, and you'll stay to do what I did, what a score of others did. We let him make love to us, because he isn't human. Yet we found old man as human as any man, and some of us stayed after the lust was gone, because love had come in. Dorothy gently unwrapped Dina's fingers from her hand and began walking away. Soon she came to the group of cottonwood trees by the bank where the creek and the river met, and there she stopped. Old man! She called in a break between the rolls of thunder. Old man! It's Dorothy! A growl as of a bear disturbed in his cave answered her, and a figure like a tree trunk come to life stepped out of the inkiness between the cottonwoods. What you come for, he said, approaching so close to her that his enormous nose almost touched hers. You want me just as I am, old man Paley, descendant of the real folk. Paley, who loves you? Or you come to give the batty old junk man a tranquilizer so you can take him by the hand like a lamb and lead him back to the slaughterhouse, the puzzle factory, where they'll stick a ice pick back of his eyeball and rip out what makes him a man and not an ox. I came... Yeah? For this, she shouted and she snatched off his hat and raced away from him toward the river. Behind her rose a bellow of agony so loud she could hear it even above the thunder. Feet splashed as he gave pursuit. Suddenly she slipped and sprawled face down in the mud. At the same time her glasses fell off. Now it was her turn to feel despair, for in this half-world she could see nothing without her glasses except the lightning flashes. She must find them, but if she delayed to hunt for them she'd lose her head start. She cried out with joy, for her groping fingers found what they sought. But the breath was knocked out of her, and she dropped the glasses again as a heavy weight fell upon her back and half stunned her. Vaguely she was aware that the hat had been taken away from her. A moment later, as her senses came back into focus, she realized she was being raised into the air. Old man was holding her in the crook of his arm, supporting part of her weight on his bulging belly. My glasses, please, my glasses, I need them. You won't be needing them for a while. But don't worry about him. I got him in my pants pocket. Old man's taken care of you. His arm tightened around her so she cried out with pain. Hoarsely, he said, You were sent down by the Gayaga to get that hat, wasn't you? Well, it didn't work, cause the old guy's striding the sky tonight and he's protecting his own. Dorothy bit her lip to keep from telling him that she had wanted to destroy the hat because she hoped that that act would also destroy the guilt of having made it in the first place. But she couldn't tell him that. If he knew she had made a false hat, he would kill her in his rage. No, not again, she said. Please don't. I'll scream. They'll come after you. They'll take you to the state hospital and lock you up for life. I swear I'll scream. Who'll hear you? Only the old guy, and he'd get a kick out of seeing you in this fix, cause you're a falser, and you took the stuffing right out of my hat and me with your falser magic. But I'm getting back what's mine and his, the same way you took it from me. The door swings both ways. He stopped walking and lowered her to a pile of wet leaves. Here we are. The forest like it was in the old days. Don't worry. Old man will protect you from the cave bear and the bull of the woods. But who'll protect you from old man, huh? Lightning exploded so near that for a second they were blinded and speechless. 
and Paley shouted, The old guy's whooping it up tonight, just like he used to do. Blood and murder and wickedness are riding the howling night air. He pounded his immense chest with his huge fist. Let the old guy and the old woman fight it out tonight. They ain't gonna stop us, Dorothy, not unless that hairy old god in the clouds is gonna fry me with his lightning. Jealous of me, cause I'm having what he can't. Lightning rammed against the ground from the charged skies, and lightning leaped up to the clouds from the charged earth. The rain fell harder than before, as if it were being shot out of a great pipe from a mountain river and pouring directly over them. But for some time the flashes did not come close to the cottonwoods. Then one ripped apart the night beside them, deafened and stunned them. And Dorothy, looking over old man's shoulder, thought she would die of fright because there was a ghost standing over them. It was tall and white, and its shroud flapped in the wind, and its arms were raised in a gesture like a curse. But it was a knife that it held in its hand. Then the fire that rose like a cross behind the figure was gone, and night rushed back in. Dorothy screamed. Old man grunted as if something had knocked the breath from him. He rose to his knees, gasped something unintelligible, and slowly got to his feet. He turned his back to Dorothy so he could face the thing in white. Lightning flashed again. Once more Dorothy screamed, for she saw the knife sticking out of his back, and the white figure had rushed toward old man. But instead of attacking him, it dropped to its knees and tried to kiss his hand and babbled for forgiveness. No ghost, no man. Dina in her white terry cloth robe. I did it because I love you, screamed Dina. Old man swaying back and forth was silent. I went back to the shanty for a knife, and I came here because I knew what you'd be doing. And I didn't want Dorothy's life ruined because of you. And I hated you, and I wanted to kill you. But I don't really hate you. Slowly, Paley reached behind him and gripped the handle of the knife. Lightning made everything white around him, and by its brief glare the women saw him jerk the blade free of his flesh. Dorothy moaned, It's terrible, terrible. All my fault, all my fault. She groped through the mud until her fingers came across the old man's jeans and its back pocket, which held her glasses. She put the glasses on only to find that she could not see anything because of the darkness. Then, and not until then, she became concerned about locating her own clothes. On her hands and knees she searched through the wet leaves and grass. She was about to give up and go back to old man when another lightning flash showed the heap to her left. Giving a cry of joy, she began to crawl to it. But another stroke of lightning showed her something else. She screamed and tried to stand up, but instead slipped and fell forward on her face. Old man, knife in hand, was walking slowly toward her. Don't try to run away, he bellowed. You'll never get away. The old guy will light things up for me so you can't sneak away in the dark. Besides, your white skin shines in the night like a rotten toadstool. You're done for. You snatched away my hat so you could get me out here defenseless, and then Dina could stab me in the back. You and her are falser witches. I know damn well. What do you think you're doing? asked Dorothy. She tried to rise again, but could not. It was as if the mud had fingers around her ankles and knees. The old guy's howling for the blood of Gayaga women, and he's going to get all the blood he wants. It's only fair. Dina put the knife in me, and the old woman got some of my blood to drink. Now it's your turn to give the old guy some of yours. Don't, screamed Dina. Don't. Dorothy had nothing to do with it, and you can't blame me after what you were doing to her. She'd done everything to me. I'm going to make the last sacrifice to old guy. Then they can do what they want to me. I don't care. I'll have had one moment of being a real, real folker. Dina and Dorothy both screamed. In the next second, lightning broke the darkness around them. Dorothy saw Dina hurl herself on old man's back and carry him downward. Then night again. There was a groan, then another blast of light. Old man was on his knees, bent almost double, but not bent so far. Dorothy could not see the handle of the knife that was in his chest. Oh, Christ, wailed Dina. When I pushed him, he must have fallen on the knife. 
I heard the bone in his chest break. Now he's dying. Paley moaned. Yeah, you done it now. You sure paid me back, didn't you? Paid me back for my taking the monkey off of your back and supporting you all these years. Oh, old man, sobbed Dina. I didn't mean to do it. I was just trying to save Dorothy and save you from yourself. Please, isn't there anything I can do for you? Sure you can. Stuff up the two big holes in my back and chest. My blood, my breath, my real souls flowing out of me. Guy in the sky, what a way to die. Killed by a crazy woman. Keep quiet, said Dorothy. Save your strength. Dina, you run to the service station. It'll still be open. Call a doctor. Don't go, Dina, he said. It's too late. I'm hanging on to my soul by its big toe now. In a minute I'll have to let go, and it'll jump out of me like a beagle after a rabbit. Dorothy, Dorothy, was it the wickedness of the old woman put you up to this? I must have meant something to you. Under the flowers, maybe it's better. I felt like a god then, not what I really am. A crazy old junk man, a alley man. Just think of it. Fifty thousand years behind me. Older than Adam and Eve by far. Now this. Dina began weeping. He lifted his hand, and she seized it. Let loose, he said faintly. I was going to knock hell out of you for blubbering. Just like a falser bitch. Kill me, then cry. You never did appreciate me. Like Dorothy. His hand's getting cold, murmured Dina. Dina, bury that damn hat with me. Least you can do. Hey, Dina. Who you going to for help when you hear that monkey chittering outside the door, huh? Who? Suddenly, before Dorothy and Dina could push him back down, he sat up. At the same time, lightning hammered into the earth nearby, and it showed them his eyes, looking past them out into the night. He spoke, and his voice was stronger, as if life had drained back into him through the holes in his flesh. Old guy's given me a good send-off. Lightning and thunder. The works. Nothing cheap about him, huh? Why not? He knows this is the end of the trail for me. The last of his worshippers. Last of the Paleys. He sank back and spoke no more. <laughs>